um, <clears throat> the permanent records of the federal government. And this morning, we are going to focus on, obviously, one of the most important documents that we have at the National Archives, which is the Constitution of the United States. And the National Archives, we are an independent federal agency that um, our mission is to uh, make available the permanent records of our government, our federal government. And here you can see a photograph of the Rotunda building uh, or the main building in Washington, D.C. and this special room, the Rotunda, that has um, not only the Declaration of Independence, but the Constitution of the United States and the Bill of Rights. Those um, three documents known collectively as the Charters of Freedom are on exhibit at that building and uh, we um, welcome people to go and visit these documents. So today we are going to focus on uh, the presidency and the executive branch and the powers that the Constitution actually gives to the president. Okay, and so we're going to take a quick review um, through these particular powers and see what those powers are by looking at examples of documents from the National Archives. So first, um, when we are going to be looking at these um, powers of the president, we're going to take a look at this photograph. And does anybody at, let's see, Landisville Middle School, can anybody tell us uh, what they see in this photograph and which presidential power they think that this might illustrate? I know it might take a little bit of time for people to come up to the front, so you guys might want to identify some students that would like to participate and kind of be near the front um, and ready when I'm able to call on you. Go ahead so, I think here it's going to be because of our camera. Go ahead. Anybody want to move up there to say something? I don't know. No, you know what? It is Roosevelt. And, Go ahead, somebody move to the front. Why is everything It's not. Oh, it's not. Waiting for you to guys talk. What What do you see happening in this photograph? What do you see happening? Go ahead. It seems like different Navy soldiers or soldiers in general are saluting and honoring their president. Okay, and why do you think they're naval um, soldier, Navy men? I can tell that they're on a ship and they're in all white. Well, exactly. Exactly. So you're using clues, right, um, from the photograph to, to decide that. Um, so do you have any idea which presidential power this might relate to? Anybody? Uh, I, thought, I thought of Theodore Roosevelt, but which it's Truman. Wait, what, what power? Though? What power of I the president? She might. She might. Uh, you're. And you're right. It isn't. It isn't um, Roosevelt. It is Harry Truman. Okay. Uh, is it like leading the army? Something like that. Leading yes, it. you're exactly right. Um, so this photograph is of President Truman, and he is aboard the USS Missouri, and he is basically walking along uh, the ship. And this does um, kind of point to the power of the presidency, uh, that the president is the commander in chief of our military. And it specifically states in our constitution that the president shall be commander in chief of the army and navy of the United States and of the militia of the several states when called into the actual service of the United States. So that is one of the main um, powers of the presidency is the power um, to be the commander in chief of our armed forces. So let's take a look at another photograph and I'll ask the students at um, Eugene Ware Elementary if they can tell me what they see here in this photograph. You may be having a microphone issue. For you okay. 
Okay, so um, then let's see if somebody at Farmington Falls would be willing to answer what they see here. I am homeschooled, so it is just me here. Okay, that's fine. Um, it looks like the president is next to a turkey. Thanksgiving Day thing, I think. Yes, you're exactly right. And um, although this is sort of a humorous, right, um, this is President George Herbert Walker Bush, and he is pardoning um, the turkey. Um, every year, uh, the President of the United States ceremoniously pardons um, a turkey um, so that the turkey will not end up on uh, anybody's table and be Thanksgiving dinner, right? That's kind of because become a ceremony that they do at the White House every year. And although that is a little bit humorous and funny, um, the President of the United States actually does have the power uh, to pardon or commute sentences for people who have um, committed offenses against the United States. So the president has the power to grant uh, pardons. And uh, so if somebody does commit a crime um, or an offense against the United States, the power has the, or the president has the power to pardon that individual, okay? So yes, the turkey's kind of humorous, but I liked the picture and thought it would be kind of fun to um, talk about that. So let's take a look, and this particular um, uh, primary source is a written document, and um, I'd like to ask maybe um, HLVCSD if anybody can tell me what they see in this document. It might be a little hard to tell. Let's see if. Don't want to make anybody dizzy, but trying to zoom in a little bit. What do you think this document might be? I think you guys went on mute again. Can you hear us now? Yes. Okay. It's the it's because the it looks like red wax stamps. Yeah, red wax seals. Okay. So um if you have a red wax seal, do what do you think this document might be? Could it be um official? We have Kathy S on the chat saying they're signature seals from December 1814. You are exactly right. Um, so these are the signature seals. And if I zoom in, I don't know if you guys can see that, um, there is actually a signature of John Quincy Adams there, um, who um, was not president at this time uh, that this document was created, but was later president. So this document, and this is another um, uh, part of the document, okay? This is the presidential part here. Um, you have uh, James Madison's signature at the bottom along with the presidential seal. So this document is actually a treaty. It is the peace treaty between the United States and Great Britain ending the um, War of 1812, and this document was signed on December 20, um, 24th of 1814, so they were actually doing work over the holidays, and one of the presidential powers is to negotiate treaties, and so this is an example of that. This was a treaty, and, it, and the Constitution specifically states that he shall have the power by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to make treaties provided two-thirds of the senators present concur. So can anybody tell me at HLVCSD if um, you've ever heard of um, the um, balance of powers the, um, that the, the Constitution gives? Separation of powers. Have you heard about that yet? Yeah. Get in here. 
have you heard about it? Uh, yeah. Okay. So what do you know about it? Uh, Time out. Who knows? Any about ideas? Powers. I will. They're still getting to that. that. The reason we're doing this is the next chapter they're learning about, they're going to be learning about it, but they are going to know that um, the separation of powers is giving certain powers to certain branches so one branch isn't more powerful than another. Exactly. And we, and you know, the framers of the constitution wanted to make sure that not one of the, one of the branches became too powerful. So what they did is they gave certain powers, right, to certain branches. And you saw here in the ability to, um, for the president to negotiate a treaty, but in order for that treaty to become official, the um, Senate, which is part of the legislative branch, has to actually um, approve that in order for it to become official. And that way, the president ha doesn't have too much power and can go and just enter into um, treaties with any country that the president desires. So this way you have that balance, that balance of power between, and you have the um, checks and balances so that the um, one branch can check the power of the other. And this is a perfect example of that. So we have another document here, and I will read to you guys what it says. It says, um, the White House, August 19th, 1981, um, to the Senate of the United States, and it says, I nominate Sandra Day O'Connor of Arizona to be an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, and it's um, because uh, Potter Stewart retired, and it is signed Ronald Reagan. And... Um, so one of the powers of the president is to nominate certain officials. And um, it says he shall nominate and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate. There you go, there's that checks and balances thing again, right? Um, it shall appoint ambassadors, other public ministers and councils, judges of the Supreme Court and all other officers of the United States whose appointments are not herein otherwise provided for. So one of the responsibilities of the president or powers of the president is to appoint um, officials um, to certain um, positions. And again, you've got the legislative branch checking that power um, by giving their consent. So again, the president cannot just um, appoint whoever they want, um, they have to be approved um, by the Senate in order to do so. So let's take a look at another document here. And this is a document that um, says the 88th Congress of the United States, and it says an act. And um, this act is was to enforce the 15th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States and um, for all other purposes. So um, it is signed by President Lyndon Baines Johnson, and this is a photograph of that signing. And President LBJ, he signed into law, this is known as the Voting Rights Act. Um, of 1965. And it was necessary um, in order to remove some of the state and local barriers that prevented African Americans um, um, from voting in many of the southern states after the Civil War. So um, in this photograph, you can see some of the civil rights leaders, including Martin Luther King Jr., and um, whose birthday um, and we will celebrate on Monday. And um, one of this. This document illustrates the power of the president to sign bills into law. And so as it says in the Constitution in Article 1, Section 7, because this is the power of the president to check the power of Congress, right? It says every bill which shall have passed the House of Representatives and the Senate shall before it become a law be presented to the president of the United States. And then if he approves, he shall sign it. So um, this shows that the power of the president to check the uh, power of Congress. Congress is the one who creates laws, but it does not come into effect unless the president actually signs the bill into law. And so that is an example of that happening with President um, LBJ signing the Voting Rights Act into law. 
But does anybody at um, Frontiac, I hope I'm saying that correctly, does anybody know what, um, what if a president doesn't agree with a law, what that is called and what they can do? So what do you think? What did you say? Say it louder. To veto it. <laughs> yeah. um, you're exactly right. Um, a president has the power to veto a law. And so just like a president can uh, sign a law into, you know, a bill into law, um, they can also veto it if they don't agree with it. If there's for some reason they don't think um, it is, you know, um, should be a law, they can veto it. And, um, but what they do, and this is an example of that. This is um, what was known as the Wagner Bill. And President um, Herbert Hoover, um, he decided to veto this bill. This was going to establish a national employment system, but he decided to veto it. And um, because of the advice of his attorney general and his secretary of labor. And if you can notice at the bottom, you have some uh, handwritten notations in there that uh, President Hoover wrote in. And so the president, they can veto a law and just like they can sign it in to law, if they veto it, if he doesn't agree with it, he can put his notations and objections um, and he returns it to the house that originated in it, um, the, that the law originated, whether that law came up in the House of Representatives or the Senate originally, um, the president would return that bill um, to one of those houses wherever it originated with the president's notations and suggestions, okay? So just like uh, you, you mentioned, it is the ability to veto a law. So just to kind of take a look really quickly and review what we've just looked at, um, some of the presidential powers that are given are the power to um, be the commander in chief, the ability to grant pardons, um, against somebody who has committed or for a person who has committed an offense against the United States, the ability to negotiate treaties, um, the, the ability and power to nominate certain officials, also to sign bills into law or to veto laws. So these are some of those things that um, the president has the power to do um, based on a specific you know, parts of the Constitution. So we're going to take a look at some other documents. And um, I don't know if you were able to receive the teacher guide and have the opportunity to look at some of these documents prior to today's session. Um, and also there is a graphic organizer uh, that students can write on um, if you had access to that. And so we're going to take a look at some of these documents and uh, and based on those six different things we just talked about you guys can tell me what those documents um which of the power of the president it is illustrating so let's see um i believe you ha there was somebody who was a homeschool group um by the person's name was stephanie if they're available if they'd like to take a look at this first document and I will read it to you because this is um, <clears throat> 19th century handwriting, which is a little difficult sometimes. It says, gentlemen of the Senate, I nominate John Marshall, Secretary of State, to be Chief Justice of the United States in the place of John Jay, who has declined his appointment. And it's um, signed John Adams, United States, January 20th of 1801. So does um, Stephanie's homeschool group, does anybody there have um, an idea of which presidential power this illustrates? All right, there are three students Hi, here. Guys. Hi there, they're debating. One is hiding here. So can we see the list of the presidential powers? Sure, let me go back there really quickly. 
so that you can see that list. There we go. Commander in chief yeah. grants pardons, negotiates treaties, nominates certain officials, signs bills into law, or vetoes laws. Nominate certain officials. Exactly. You're right. Um, this is a document where uh, President Adams is nominating John Marshall um, to the um, be um, a Supreme Court justice. And you know what I find fascinating about this document here? What I find fascinating about it is it is just one sentence long. But this one sentence really changed the judicial um, branch of government for many years to come. John Marshall actually served on the Supreme Court for over 30 years. And under John Marshall, the judicial department um, or the judicial branch of government really came into its own and had the um, established judicial review and the ability to review different laws and to determine if um, they were constitutional. So this one sentence really affected the way the United States government and the judicial branch specifically, um, how it came to be under this particular Supreme Court justice. So kind of interesting, one sentence really had um, a lot of effect on uh, the, uh, the United States government and how we, you know, worked things um, how, how the judicial uh, branch works. So kind of interesting, so very good. So let's see, do we have students at Landisville Middle? Um, let's take a look at this next document I will put up. Let me switch over here and see if that you can see. I will, um, on the left hand side is uh, the cover uh, of this particular document, a leather bound gold embossed cover. And on the right hand side is um, the beginning and it says John F. Kennedy. It says the President of the United States of America to all to whom these presents come, um, greeting and it says here on this first page that um, know ye that whereas the treaty banning nuclear weapon tests in the atmosphere in outer space and underwater was signed at Moscow on August 5th, 1963 by the respective plenipotentiaries, that's a hard word to say, of uh, the United States of America, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics, um, um, which is Russia, and was thereafter open to other states for signature at Washington, London, and Moscow. So does Landisville Middle have um, an understanding of what this document is? Which power of the presidency is it showing us? The it's showing um, like negotiates treaties. Exactly, you are right. And this is the signatory page of that particular document. You see the presidential seal right here. You see John F. Kennedy's signature and then his secretary of state is listed here, Rusk. And um, yeah, this is showing us the ability for a president to um, sign in to, you know, to, to negotiate treaties. And uh, this is a photograph of President Kennedy signing this particular uh, treaty, which was to, you know, outlaw nuclear tests and um, in the oceans or in outer space or in our atmosphere. And uh, this particular uh, treaty, right, the president would send um, his um, 
people to help negotiate that treaty. And then once that negotiate that treaty is negotiated, then it has to go through uh, and given um, acceptance and approved by the Senate in the legislative um, branch of government. And then uh, the president can sign it. And so this is actually one of the very last things that President Kennedy did, because this was um, in October of 1963. And um, um, sadly, he was assassinated just a month later. Um, so this was one of the, the last major international uh, things that President Kennedy was involved in. And um, the thing is, is it was those three countries, the United States, the United Kingdom, and Russia that signed this treaty. But since then, um, over 200 countries have gone and um, signed this particular um, treaty so that they agree agreed to that they would not do these things um, to um, make sure that we are not testing nuclear um, weapons in, you know, in the atmosphere or underwater or in outer space. So very good, guys. Okay, let's see. Do we have um, Farmington Falls again? It, um, if you would like to take a look at this next photo and tell me what you think the power, which power this one illustrates. Uh, the commander in chief. Exactly. And why do you think that? Uh, that's the, like, looks like the army, and the okay. president in the middle wearing the suit. Yes, you are exactly right um, that this is the president. Um, this was George W. Bush, and he is actually at Camp Lejeune. And these these aren't actually this isn't the army. These are these um, soldiers are actually Marines. Um, but you wouldn't know that just by looking, you know, at their. Um, but they are um, part of our military. And um, yes, this particular photograph does illustrate the power of the president. Uh, that um, to be commander in chief. And, you know, this is one of the, the hardest powers that the president has because um, being the commander in chief, you are responsible for sending, you know, men and women into uh, combat. And, um, you know, some of them may lose their lives um, by uh, that role. And that's a really hard burden to handle when you are the person in charge um, of that and have that power to send them into harm's way. And so um, it is definitely um, one of the powers of the president, but in my opinion, probably one of the harder um, powers of the presidency. So let's take a look at um, another document. And um, are we still having issues with uh, Eugene Ware's microphone? Can you hear us? Can I you hear can. us? I can, okay. yes. Fantastic. Let me put up another document and um, for you guys to take a look at. Whoops, I accidentally hit the wrong button here. Let me switch over. Why is it doing that? Um, over to this particular document here. And I'm going to read a little bit of it. And this might be a little hard, but it is dated. Um, Let's see, uh, September 8th of 1974. And um, it says, as a result of certain acts or omissions occurring before his resignation from the office of the president, Richard Nixon has become liable to possible indictment and trial for offenses against the United States. Whether or not he shall be so prosecuted depends on findings of the appropriate grand jury and on the discretion of the authorized pro prosecutor. Should indictment ensue, the accused shall be or then be entitled to a fair trial um, by an impartial jury as granted to every individual by the Constitution. But it is believed that a trial of Richard Nixon, if it become necessary, could not fairly begin until a year or more has elapsed. In the meantime, the tranquility of which this nation has been restored by the events of recent weeks could be irreparably lost by the prospects of bringing to trial a former president of the United States. The prospects 
of such trial will cause prolonged and divisive debate over the propriety of exposing to further punishment and degradation a man who has already paid the unprecedented penalty of relinquishing the highest elective office of the United States. So I want you guys to listen to this part, okay, at um, Eugene Ware. It says, now, therefore, I, Gerald R. Ford, President of the United States, pursuant to the pardon power conferred upon me by Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution, have granted, and by these presents do grant a full, free, and absolute pardon unto Richard Nixon for all offenses against the United States, which he, Richard Nixon, has committed or may have committed or taken part in during the period from January 20th, 20th 1969 through August 9th, 1974. So do you guys, I know that was a lot of words and I know that was difficult, but do you know which power of the presidency this document said it was giving or that it was doing that the president had? Now it's, it's on the screen. The power to pardon. Exactly. This document is a pardon. Gerald Ford became president after um, President Nixon resigned. The the person who had been the vice president had actually resigned before even that, um, before President um Nixon had, so there was no vice president at the time. Gerald Ford was Speaker of the House, and so he became president, and um, he then decided to use the power in the Constitution given to him, the power to pardon, to pardon President Nixon. Even though he had resigned the office, he said, you know what, it's not going to be any good for the, for the country if we have to wait and see if this president um, is indicted or, you know, made guilty or, you know, charged um, with certain crimes against the United States. So he decided in order to make sure that the um, country would heal, that he would pardon uh, President Nixon for any wrongdoing. So this was a very controversial um, decision made by President Ford. Many people didn't agree with it, um, but what did he do? He used the power of the presidency given to him by the Constitution to do this and, and hope that the country could move forward. And so he, he, did, um, he did do that and use that power um, to, to make sure that the country would move forward. So an example of that. Okay, so let's take a look at the next document, and I will ask the students at um, HLV CSD. Um, this is a document here. It says the 83rd Congress of the United States, and it states, uh, the following is designated as the Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag. And it says, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm sure that makes a lot of sense to you guys. You probably say it every morning. Um, and then it says, such pledge should be rendered by standing with the right hand over the heart, However, civilians um, will always show full respect to the flag when the pledge is given by merely standing at attention, men removing the headdress, and persons in uniform shall render the military salute. So, this is a joint resolution, which means that it came from both the House and Senate, and it is signed by Dwight D. Eisenhower, um, the president at the time. So does anybody at HLV CSD know which power of the presidency this particular document is illustrating? Uh, it's like how to act during the a Pledge of Allegiance. It is, it is showing us um, how to act during the Pledge of Allegiance, but this is 
to amend the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And it came from, I'm putting, I'm, I'm giving you a hard one here. It came from the legislative branch and it is going to the executive branch and you have a president that has signed it. So which power of the presidency does this illustrate? Commander in chief, um, ability to nominate officials, uh, negotiate treaties, sign a bill into law or to veto? Sign a bill into law. Exactly, you're right. Um, the reason why this was done is um, at the time, the Pledge of Allegiance was different than it is today. Um, and uh, they added the words under God, as well as um, they made sure that everybody would place their hand over their heart. When, would any, would somebody at HLB CSC mind putting their microphone on for me? Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, there's just a lot of feedback. Um, so they decided that they were going to change the Pledge of Allegiance, and this is the bill that had that happen. Um, the both branches, um, when you have a joint resolution, that means that both the House and the um, Senate agree, and it goes to the president's desk, and it is signed into law. Um, so uh, you've got uh, Dwight Eisenhower's signature here um, signing this bill into law. Okay. So let's take a look at the, a very last document here. And we'll see if um, Frontiac, I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm saying that right, can tell me which particular this uh, document, which power of the presidency this document is showing. So it says to the House of Representatives, um, for reasons heretofore stated in my several acts uh, or my several veto messages to Congress upon the subject of reconstruction, I return without my approval the joint resolution to carry into effect the, the several acts providing for um, the more efficient government of the rebel states and appropriating for that purpose the sum of $1 million. Signed, Andrew Johnson, Washington, D.C., July 19th of 1867. Um, so does um, Frontiac have an... Um, Frontenac. Frontenac, okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we got one. Okay. So what is that one? What's the power? <laughs> Did you hear what I what I said when I read it? No. Did somebody have the answer on this one? Nobody. Nobody. Mm -hmm. We didn't hear. <laughs> you. Okay. So let me quickly say it says uh, stated in my several veto messages to Congress upon the subject of reconstruction, I return without my approval the joint resolution to carry into effect the several acts providing for the more efficient government of the rebel states and appropriating for um, that purpose the sum of $1 million. Signed, Andrew Johnson. Veto? Exactly. It is a veto. You are correct. He he flat out says it, right? He said, I veto this. I've given you messages that I veto this. I do not agree with it. It is not coming into law. So this was Andrew Johnson after the Civil War, and there was a period of time known as Reconstruction, where um, <clears throat> the southern states were trying to, you know, um, rebuild after the war, and um, the government was determining if they were going to help with that by providing money to those states. And the president at the time was like, nope, I'm not going to do it. I don't agree with this. We are not giving a million dollars to the southern states in order to um, 
rebuild. Um, after this uh, veto, um, a, a bit later, there were some acts that were actually approved um, and what did provide aid and, and money and other things to the South to help rebuild um, after the Civil War. But these examples of, of the presidency's power or the president's powers, hopefully you've been able to see um, by looking at different documents, um, photographs even, um, uh, at, that we have at the National Archives, those important um, powers of the presidency, um, which are given to the president in um, <clears throat> the Constitution. Um, we looked at, you know, the commander in chief, the ability to have the power to grant pardons, to negotiate treaties, nominate certain officials, sign bills into law, and um, or to veto laws. So um, we have a few minutes, I think, and um, I am happy to take questions. Um, if you have questions about the National Archives or any of the documents that we looked at today, I'd be happy happy to try to answer those. Um, does, um, I'm going to say it wrong again, Front, Frontenac, do you guys have any questions for me about any of the documents or about the National Archives? <clears throat> and those other sites, if you guys are thinking about some possible questions for me, um, I will do my best to answer them. And I'll call on each of you. We do have a question from Kathy S. Um, oh. asking, may we tour the National Archives? Um, it depends where you are. Um, the, the National Archives in Washington, D.C. does have our um, exhibits and museum, okay? You're not able to tour the stacks or to go back. It's not like a library where you can go and just pull things off the shelf and take a look and check them out. Um, at an archives is different. Uh, you have to get a researcher card. You have to go in. You have to request the records you would like to see. And then an archivist will pull them, bring them to you, and you have to look at them in our research rooms at our different facilities. Um, we don't have interlibrary loan. We do not send documents from one facility to another um, because um, these are original materials um, that it's not like a library that may have, you know, multiple libraries throughout the world would have the same books. This is not the same situation. You only have one, maybe two copies of something. And so that's why we leave them in the facilities that they're at and why we have such um, you know, control and measures for people to see them. Um, but we do have um, at our presidential libraries, which are part of the National Archives system, Herbert Hoover Forward, um, those facilities also have exhibits that you can see. And some of our uh, regional facilities throughout the country also have small exhibits, but you can't necessarily go and tour the stacks of, of what we have. You can see different exhibits, but not that. But you have to be 14 years old in order to get a researcher card and um, to come and do um, research. And then we do um, provide you with paper. Um, you're not allowed to bring in your own things. You're not allowed to use pen. You can only use pencil. Um, you can um, use a flatbed scanner or you can also take pictures of things or scan on our scanners um, if you want to you know, have copies of those things um, if you would like to do that. So that is a great question. Um, Frontiac, if you um, wanted to ask a question. Um. Does the president get paid while running office? While what does the president receive a salary while in office? Yes. yes. The president does. Um, and actually, the post activity for uh, this follow up that was included in the teacher guide is to actually create a job announcement for the presidency. And you can look in Article 2, Section 1, which gives you the qualifications for the president. And it also um, provides, you know, what the compensation is. That compensation has changed over time, obviously, um, but that is something that you can um, provide or that you can do after today's program. But yes, the um, president does receive a salary. Okay, let's see. Um, We've got one more. I've, uh, 
I think we're only going to have a chance to do one per site, or do we have time, Stephanie? Looks like we have we have time for one more. We do. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Frontenac. If the president is impeached, can the president run for office again? Um, I do not know off the top of my head if that is feasible. Does anybody? I know um, the presidents in the past. I don't think it's feasible. I don't. I don't think, think it is to. either. I don't think it is either. But I did not want to misspeak. Thank you for jumping in. Um, and um, I do not think it is. It's it's kind of um, one of those things that if you've been removed because of potential um, criminal activity, you know, wrongdoings. I'm sorry. Sometimes it's criminal activity or wrongdoings, like you said. Exactly, that you um, probably are not going to be able, and it may just be running for that particular office. I don't know that it, it bans you from running from all offices. Um, I do have one comment for those that are tuning in. I went to Washington, D.C. a few years ago with my family. If you guys with the, in your schools take the time to have your kids research on your state senator's websites, you can sign up for special perks for being. Like we had pre breakfast with our senator. We got a special tour of the Capitol building. We got a special tour of the, the archives just by logging on to our senator's website. It's definitely a good thing to do. You and you guys, um, if you have that opportunity, I would definitely take it. You should be so fortunate to do that. Okay, let's see. Um, the homeschool um, with the name Stephanie. If you guys have any questions, no, thank you. Okay, all right. All right. Thank you. What about HLV CSD? Do you guys have questions? We don't. Thank you for your time today. All right. Thank you. What about Eugene Ware? Yes. Okay. What question do you have? How many treaties have been signed in the history of U the United States? Oh, wow. That's a good question. I do not know the answer to that, but I bet the State Department probably has something on their website um, because those negotiate those treaties are negotiated um, by the State Department, which falls under the executive branch, which is, you know, the, the president. Um, I bet it probably has information on that. That's a great question. I'd like to know that the answer to that. I'm sorry. I don't know. Do we have time for one more? Sure. Were those documents real? So the documents that I showed you today are digital scans of the originals that we keep in the National Archives. Um, because of preservation, uh, which is us trying to make sure that these documents are in the best possible environment, right? Um, we, um, we don't want to be touching them or handling them or anything like that. So when I do a, a video conference like this, all I do is I make copies of a digital scan. So you're seeing the authenticity of the document, the color that the paper is and um, everything like that. But I don't want to use these actual documents, right? Because the lights from my document camera and the lights that I have in here could damage it um, over over time. And so that is a great question. They're not the actual documents. I don't have them right here. Um, they are at the National Archives in um, acid free um, boxes and um, put in the best possible conditions so that these documents can be seen um, by future, um, you know, Americans. Uh, we want these documents to be available for your children, your grandchildren, even your great grandchildren to come to the National Archives and to be able to see them. So that is a great question. Um, <clears throat> although they're not the real original documents here with me today, they are digital scans of the originals. But if you go to Washington, D.C. and um, see the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights, those are the original documents there um, that are on exhibit in the rotunda. So very good. 
Okay, let's see. Um, Farmington Falls, do you have questions? No, no, thank you. Thank you for the class. Okay. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. And then what about um, Lansville Middle? Does anybody there have questions? Yes, we do. Yes, we do have a question, but we want to, we were sharing some information that we looked up as well. From a oh, question. great. Thanks. So we actually found out that even if a president is impeached, he or she can rerun for office. Can? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Apparently, yes. And they can be elected. Well, run for the same office that they were impeached from or run for any office? Run from one. I think it's at any. Run but. for the same office that they. Okay. Were. Okay, that's good to know. It's Thank shocking, you. But yes. <laughs> it is shocking. <laughs> okay, so you guys have questions. What are you your questions? Uh, not really. No, nope, we're no. good. Okay. We're no. Good. Thank you. Okay. Thank well, thanks you. everybody. Did I catch everybody? I don't want to make I, or anybody on the chat that had a question. Thank you. For Looks good. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for joining me today. Um, hopefully you learned a little bit about the National Archives and also the powers of the presidency. And hopefully we can get together in the future to learn more about uh, the United States government or important events in American history by looking at the holdings of the National Archives. All right. Thank you so much, Jenny. Thanks You're welcome. for joining us. Have a great day. Definitely. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Bye.